and welcome to my channel. If this is your first time here, my name is Angie and I'm a chemist who loves makeup. Today, we will be talking about the biggest piece of legislation that has passed for regulation of cosmetics in the U.S. since 1966. And that piece of legislation was the Modernization of Cosmetic Regulation Act, which is also being referred to as MOCRA. And this piece of legislation was enacted on December 29th, 2022. Remember that date. The way that we are gonna go through this is I am going to hit the key components that I think as a consumer you might find the most interesting or I think that is going to have a major impact on the industry. And those key components are going to be as follows. Adverse event reporting, GMP requirements, registration and product listing, safety substantiation, labeling, record keeping, mandatory authority recall, talc testing, and PFOS safety. So first, we're gonna talk about the adverse events. If you were to go in and read this piece of legislation, I will link this down below if you would like to see it in its entirety. There is a reference to the secretary. This secretary refers to the secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. So when it says secretary, if you're looking through it, that is the person that it's referring to throughout this whole document. And that brings us to the adverse events portion of this legislation. And this section requires companies to report adverse events that are reported to them by their customers. And it's kind of vague, but it seems like the responsible party for reporting this is the company itself if their name appears on the labeling and the packaging. Now, if it's a private label, maybe if the private label's name is on there, then they are required. So if a customer reports an adverse event due to a product, then the company is required to report that to the secretary within 15 days, according to this guidance. And this also requires companies to keep records of these adverse events for six years. And it says three years for small businesses. But it is kind of vague. I'm really not sure how many companies would actually fit into that. So let's just say six years is a blanket statement. If the secretary determines that the fragrance or the flavor is the cause of these adverse events, they can request the specific ingredients that make up that flavor or fragrance. If you've been familiar with it, flavor and fragrances are considered a trade secret because if you were to list them on your packaging and whatnot, someone can reverse engineer that flavor or fragrance. So that's why normally it just says flavoring, fragrance, something of that sort. But if it is determined that that is the cause the secretary does, they can request those specific ingredients. The responsible person has 30 days to provide that information. Part of this as well is that companies can provide a safety report to deny that their product caused this adverse reaction. This part is actually beneficial for the companies, actually allows the company to prove that their product is safe, didn't cause these reactions, and this section also makes it clear that by the companies reporting these adverse events, they are not admitting fault to this event. So the next is GMP. So GMP stands for Good Manufacturing Practices. You have this across every industry, food, pharma, etc. These are a set of industry guidelines to follow if you're producing a specific type of product under some regulated industry. This is going to be pretty slow to implement. In fact, the secretary has two years, so that's December 29th, 2024, if you were keeping track of that date earlier, to share that there are gonna be proposed rules, and three years to actually share the official rules. This section is super vague right now because we don't have these guidelines out yet. It does say that the secretary is to work with the industry to help establish these guidelines and try to make sure that this does not hinder small businesses. So I can't say anything specific until these guidelines are put out. When they do come out, I will probably make a video on that to explain further what they mean or what the impact could be. But for now, I'm gonna kind of give you things that this could mean. So one could be documentation. Documentation is very important. What has to be documented, how your documents are controlled. Another could be cleaning requirements, how you verify that you've cleaned properly, um, preventing allergens, where you're storing your ingredients, where you're storing your product, how do you control for pests in your facility. If a manufacturing facility is already producing drug products, then they should already have 
pretty good standards. Probably going to be more strict than what will get implemented for cosmetics, I would imagine. The next big section is registration and product listing. So up until this point, registering your products or facility with the FDA was voluntary, that program has been shut down now because it is now going to be mandatory. So any facility that currently manufactures or processes cosmetic products, processing by meaning you're putting the bulk product into its final packaging, is now required to register with the FDA. They have one year to register if they are currently producing and 60 days if they are a new facility. Each specific product must be registered by the responsible person, AKA the brand. We don't know how much any of this registration is gonna cost. All we know is that I think it was $15 million they got to enact this. So they, we could, it could get kind of pricey. We're, we don't have official numbers yet how much each of these are gonna cost. But companies can do a single submission if it's basically the same product, it only differs by fragrance or color or concentration of ingredients. So that would make it easier. That would kind of take a little bit of the cost off of it because imagine if you had a foundation line, you have 50 shades and you have to register each individual shades. So it sounds like that's not gonna be the case that if it only differs by those things, like basically it sounds like if you can make the same box with the same ingredients on it, that you can register it on a single submission. And the FDA has the ability to suspend your registration, meaning you would not be able to produce products. The way that this would probably be most likely to end up getting suspended would be due to an FDA audit. If it's gonna be anything like pharma, the FDA shows up unexpected. You have an idea because it's usually about every two years if you're in good standing, but they just kind of show up out of nowhere. So if you had one of these surprise visits from the FDA, look through all your stuff and then they find too many things or very big things, they give you what's called a 483 letter and you have to respond with how you are going to correct these problems that they found. And if you don't do that in a timely manner or on a later visit they come back and you didn't do that, because then at that point, that's probably when they would consider pulling your registration. Another very big section of this is going to be safety substantiation. So the safety substantiation portion of this is vague. It just kind of requires that you have proof that your product is safe. It's not cut and dry. It does not give you any sort of requirements, what you are required to have, but there are things that I think would be heavily suggested. One of those key things is gonna be microbial testing. I think this is arguably the biggest safety concern for products. And that's what we see the most recalls for in microbial contamination. Another thing that I've seen people in the industry suggest could happen could be a 48 hour patch test in which the product would have to be tested on skin for 48 hours, see if there's any severe reactions, that kind of thing. Other documentation could be maybe studies about specific ingredients, specific types of products. What makes a product defined as safe? The safety has to be proven if you were to use the product in a way that it is either typically used for that product, i.e. a lipstick going on the lips, or how you are instructed in the product instructions to use this product. So that means, for instance, the pressed pigments that people use on their eyes, if you have issues with it, maybe that's not covered in here because you're, the company would argue they instructed you not to use that on the eyes. That is not following instructions that you were provided on the packaging and therefore for the company does not have to prove safety for your uses in those instances. The other thing in here is very clearly defined. Minor skin irritation does not make a product unsafe. If you get slight skin irritation or anything like that, which I know a lot of us I'm sure are very familiar with this, that does not make a product unsafe in the eyes of this act. So although this may be a burden on the companies, I think a lot of the things in this act do actually protect the companies in the event they do receive complaints. The next section is labeling. This one's pretty minor because 
The last big piece of legislation was 1966 was the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act. So that already kind of gave us a lot of labeling requirements. So, so this section is pretty small and unexciting, but the secretary has to define which allergens are going to be considered needing to be specifically called out on an ingredients list. And if the company has those allergens in their product, they do have to specifically call them out on the packaging. Record keeping. So this is going to be huge. In any regulated industry, documentation is everything. If you did not write it, it did not happen. And you are supposed to do this contemporaneously. The reason why this is so important is because, especially if you're in a very high volume manufacturing facility, you probably are not gonna remember something that happened a month ago, a couple weeks ago, sometimes even the next day. So that's why it's important that it gets written down. And if you're getting an inspection, some of these documents might be six months to a year prior to that date. How are you going to remember that? So the secretary is allowed to ask for any documentation that is needed for them to do an investigation if the product is adulterated. Adulterated means that it is not what it says it is and can present a risk to health and human safety. So this also says that companies cannot use this section to say what the secretary can or cannot ask for. Basically, they can ask for whatever they want. And documentation can include things like the time of cleaning, the procedure for your testing. There's a lot of things that have to be documented. Everything has to be documented and there's very specific rules on all of this. The next is mandatory authority recall. So now the FDA has the authority to recall cosmetic products just like they would be able to do drugs. For the most part, I think most companies are gonna voluntarily recall their products. I say voluntary, but it's not really voluntary. You're gonna have to do it. This is just you taking the initiative to do it and just getting it done versus having this whole outrage that the FDA had to pull your product off the shelves. What's going to make the company look a lot worse? The one thing that this could, the one situation that this could have prevented in the past would have been the Claire situation. So there was testing that was done where these eyeshadow palettes that are going to children were tested to contain asbestos. Claire's claim they didn't have asbestos. I don't know if we were provided documents or that, or the FDA was, but if they, they did or it wasn't what the FDA was requiring. And eventually put the FDA put out a warning about this product because Claire's refused to pull it off the shelves. And eventually Claire's got pressured into pulling it off the shelves. Recalls are very different than just taking an item off the shelves. There's very specific places it has to be listed. It has to get listed on the FDA website of recalls, usually at point of sale. So on your website, you're gonna have to put it. Speaking of Claire's, that brings us to talc. So one year from the enactment date, so that's gonna be December of this year, December 29th of this year, regulation is going to have to be proposed for testing of talc. This will probably involve the USP. So the USP is the United States Pharmacopeia. They establish testing guidelines, for pharmaceutical ingredients and products. There's also EP, which is the European Pharmacopoeia, and JP, which is Japanese Pharmacopoeia. A lot of similarities between the three. There is a little bit of difference, but mostly they, they establish these requirements based on what the ingredient is at risk for contamination. For instance, the ingredient talc would have to be tested for asbestos. Pharmacopoeias, specifically the USP because this is the FDA in the US. So I think between the FDA and or the USP, specific testing methods for asbestos are gonna be put out. I think there's already some in the USP, but I feel like they're gonna have to improve on it because I think there's a little bit of false positives or false negatives within that testing, if I remember correctly. So basically this established testing method is going to have to be put in there and companies are gonna be required to follow that. So for most testing requirements of contamination, you will have some kind of limit, like no more than like 10 ppm. For asbestos, it's most likely, I would bet money on it, is going to be the absence of asbestos. No asbestos whatsoever. If any detected, nope, that's it. It's not, it's not good, you can't use that talc. And the vendors or manufacturers of the talc are going to have to provide that this testing has been completed. The cosmetic manufacturers that are purchasing this talc should also do their own third party testing to also prove that this talc is asbestos free. So the next, the next, the next portion of this act is PFAS. This stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. And they're used to make things like Teflon, that kind of thing. You find them in some makeup. I will not get into 
the safety or the details on here, but there has been some debate on the safety of these ingredients. So the secretary has three years from the date of enactment, December 29th, 2022. So this is my friend. This is Bruno. Say hi, Bruno. And he's gone now. Back to PFOS. But this legislation is going to require that a safety assessment is made within three years of this act. So who is going to be impacted by this? So this is not going to apply to R&D labs. They are not going to have to meet certain requirements, etc. They are for research and development purposes for a reason. This does not include facilities or warehouses that only store product or they only do secondary packaging. Secondary packaging is anything that your bulk product is not in. So if you have your foundation in the bottle, anything an excess of packaging to that bottle is not considered to be under the scope of this law. The ma manufacturers and processors of cosmetic processes are obviously going to be majorly impacted by this because now this is a whole new set of regulations that they are going to have to follow. If they are manufacturers of drug products that are considered cosmetics, they should already be following most of these things or have the capability to do this with no issues. The next is brands. This is going to be an added cost. So this could impact smaller brands for sure. If you're an indie brand, maybe your manufacturing of your products is going to get more expensive because the manufacturers are now going to have to have extra people to make sure documentation is in place. Extra testing might have to be getting done. A lot of behind the scenes work other than just making the product may bring added costs to these indie brands. So this could affect some smaller brands and may price them out of it, even though that is not the goal of this law. I don't think bigger brands, the L'Oreal's, the Estee Lauder's, um, under big corporations, I don't really think are gonna be impacted by this. They probably already follow a lot of these standards or the cost will be not that significant to them in terms of increase. The registration costs could also affect smaller brands too, because you're gonna have to pay for each product. I assume bigger brands were probably already voluntarily doing it. That might be a big assumption. But if it's not that much, then it, if it's like $500, for instance, that may not really affect a smaller brand that much in the grand scheme of things. But we don't know what that cost is yet, so I can't really say if I think that that's a significant cost or an insignificant cost. The other group of people is going to be consumers, aka probably you watching. And that is because this, as we said, this could infect indie brands. So that might mean there are less non-large brand options for you to buy. And I know a lot of people really prefer to buy from indie brands. So hopefully that's not the case, but I think that is something that may happen. In terms of safety, I don't see this having a negative impact on safety. I hope your products are safe or safer due to this act. The last thoughts I wanna give you are in terms of how I think this is gonna affect the clean beauty industry. Because the clean beauty industry use the non-regulation of the cosmetic industry as such a big part of their marketing. But I think clean beauty is going to still be around. And I'm going to tell you why. That is because this doesn't specifically ban any specific ingredient. The only one it even mentions by name in terms of banning is PFAS, and that's still to be determined. And because clean beauty thrives so much on those long list of banned ingredients, I still think they're gonna be able to do that. I still think they're gonna use this as a marketing tool. Even though with this act, no specific ingredient is banned, but if there was proof that this ingredient is unsafe, the FDA can look into the product and pull it off the shelves. But that could be a while from now. We're still a couple of years away from all of this going into full effect. So for now, we're going to kind of see what more information comes out when the GMP regulations come out. I will be more than happy to make a video on that to kind of give you more behind the scenes. But I would really love to hear your thoughts down below. What do you think of this? How do you think this is going to impact the beauty industry? And tell me if you learned something today. And if you like this kind of video, give this video a thumbs up and I will see you in my next video.